Good day chaps. So today's video is going to cover a subject I've been meaning to do for some time and it's covering arguably one of the biggest mistakes in tank law and the worst example of circular sourcing in this field to date. I'm going to talk about the Churchill Avery, its petard spigot mortar and the mistakes made by just about everybody who has ever written about this machine. When one mentions the Avri, the abbreviation for Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers, also occasionally referred to as the Assault Vehicle Royal Engineers, they normally think of the Churchill tank and a 290mm petard mortar. And this crops up everywhere, and I do mean everywhere, from tank museums, engineer museums, social media, books, models, forums, Wikipedia, you name it. In fact, try it yourself. Type 290mm petard spigot mortar and look at the results. Except here's the thing, it's not 290mm. It never was. In fact, it's not even close. This is the error I wish to highlight. The actual measurement of the mortar tube is 230mm from flange to flange or 240mm from liner to liner. The diameter of the round itself is 9 inches or 228 millimetres give or take and none of these measurements are even close to 290 millimetres. So this isn't a close miss or near enough. It's 50 to 60 millimetres out. So if this is the case, why does everybody get it so horribly wrong? Well, for that we need to look at the root of the problem and one that affects not just the vehicle, but the study of armoured vehicles as a whole, and its circular sourcing. This is sadly very common in tank-based literature and studies, where faulty information is reproduced over and over again, and has only become worse with the inclusion of social media, be it the subject of Ronson's and Tommy Cooker's myth, or the Tog has a 17-pounder gun myth, or in this case the 290mm petard spigot mortar fitted to the Avery. The original source may well have been an honest mistake, or it may have been done on purpose, but either way it points to a lack of sufficient research or understanding of the subject, and even worse is when the fact is pointed out that the mistake was made, the author or authors would rather keep the current narrative than accept a mistake was made and no attempt will be done to rectify this in order to save face or at our sheer stubborn ignorance for that matter. From time to time we see that a mistake was later identified and the author of the original source of mistake will strive to remedy this. A good example being the incorrect use of the term Porsche turret when talking about the early production Tiger II. This error has been discovered to be an honest mistake taken from a time when little writing had been done on the subject and has been traced back to a translation misunderstanding when the translator read the original documentation. And since then a good deal of work has been done to remedy this error by the original author and many others. And it's considered an honest mistake as it's both recognised and attempts have been made to rectify it. And now very few people use the word Porsche turret. However, the example of the Avery main weapon is, in my standards, considered one of the worst examples, as this was not a simple translation mistake, but something tangible and real that at any point in the last 50 odd years could have easily been checked and measured. There are, after all, quite a few surviving examples in major collections all over the world, and a simple one minute check would have prevented this. So that leads us to the next question. Why 290mm in the first place? For this, we need to jump back a bit to the invention of the weapon and what came beforehand. The development of the Avery begins with the Lieutenant J.J. Denovan, a Canadian officer, not British, after the alleged failings of the Churchill tanks to get off the beach during the disastrous Dieppe raid. It might surprise some then that the statement no tanks got off the beach is also incorrect and once again a circular sourcing problem. Several of these tanks did, and they even went back to help their stranded mates. An order was given for all the tanks to return to the beach in the hope of being picked up by the Royal Navy. 
This resulted in most of the tanks being abandoned on the beach, and this fact has been wrongly interpreted that no tanks ever got off the beach. Some Churchill tanks were knocked out of action by having their track shot off, which was recorded in later seized German documentation. They found that their small caliber anti-tank guns were unable to penetrate the thick armor, but they could easily break the old style Churchill tracks. There was also engineer assault vehicles on the day, including carpet layers and flamethrowers, but these were not deemed effective. Lieutenant Denovan went on to design an armored tracked assault vehicle that was more practical for the engineers and offered them a considerably easier job in delivering explosives while under fire during a beach landing. This led him to converting a two-pounder Churchill initially with a model spigot and later a six-pounder Churchill, while firing trials were carried out on a Covenanter tank fitted with the same device. The device that was used was a modified blacker bombard spigot mortar, otherwise simply known as the 29mm spigot. The spigot itself was the long rod in the middle of the weapon that the round was slid onto. This round itself had a 20 pound plastic high explosive charge. The forebear of the high explosive squash head rounds, or HESH, with that terminology not coming into common practice until post World War II. The 20 pound round was found not to be powerful enough to blast through thick walls, and after a brief stint with the Jas Williams and Sons Company of Lancaster, it would be passed over to ICI Chemicals, who would then develop a large 9 inch round or 228mm bomb although it's also worth noting that the term flying dustbin was a code word given to the original project, not just a nickname, and that carried over, and so began the 29mm Petard Spigot Mortar Avery. Now at some point, somebody has seen this written as 29.0mm, and rather than check, simply rewritten it as 290mm, and so the myth began and ever since it's been written about around the world with the wrong caliber. And yet, if one looks at all the original wartime documentation on the subject, it lists the correct names and even caliber. So what can we learn from this? Well, the most important fact is to check, double check, and correctly research stuff. All too often I see people saying, I've done my research, and by that they've just gone and googled something. Well, that's not research. Go and measure or check something yourself. And if you can't, then find somebody who can go and measure it for you. Most museums will happily check something or measure something, if asked politely, and they often ask very little in exchange. In this instance, the information and pictures were kindly provided by Tim Isaacs at the Cobberton Combat Collection in Devon and Dr. Dewell Venter of the South African Armour Museum. Both excellent little museums with a lot to see and do, and I'll link both of these venues in the description below. And so finally, how can you, the viewers, help? Well, that's easy enough. Next time you see 290 millimeters being touted around, just kindly and politely point out that it's not. This way, slowly, but surely, we will hopefully get to see the real information being displayed and this 50-year-old mistake will gradually be phased out and the correct information displayed. But until that time, I hope you have a good day and you enjoyed this video or you learned something new. And until next time guys, toodle pip.